Hi, and welcome back. And this is actually one of my favorite portions to give. When I was teaching fluid mechanics at the university, I called this turbulence appreciation. And ultimately, the, one of the craziest parts about fluid mechanics is, is, is when all of these flows, right? You, you've seen a little bit, we've solved a little bit of the flows that we can analytically, but conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, all of it is true even at the smallest length scales. And so quickly, whether you're looking at flow behind a rock, fluids start twisting, tumbling, all of the stuff, and you actually get, uh, you can get some really beautiful uh, looking things happening, but you can get, ultimately it's turbulence. Um, turbulence does everything from create you know, drag around vehicles to uh, mixing your coffee better. And so what I want to do is, is this is a little bit of a combination in, in the undergraduate, it's the chapter eight book, but also in Panton, this is sort of towards the end of ch chapter 26. So I am going to teach this at sort of this mixed undergraduate graduate level and walk through, and then we'll, we'll kind of talk, I'll leave some room here sir, for some beautiful visualizations on the right, but going to talk through ultimately uh, how do we start looking at turbulence. And the first part, it's actually, the, it's called the Reynolds analogy, okay? And what we're doing here is ultimately uh, taking the average of everything. So the conservation of, of mass equation is this, if you time average the whole thing, well, you just get the time average it also has to be divergence free. So like that's, that's sort of the easy one, but the harder one is the momentum equation. Okay. So we'll, we'll stick to uh, this, so the rho, there's the time rate of change of the ith velocity. And then you have right, u j del j u i, and that's equal to negative gradient of pressure and then um, viscosity and then I'll say del squared u i. So when you come forth and average all of this, let's do the easy ones quick. Uh, the averaging it, on anything linear is just super easy. And then because time average, that would, that would go away. However, this term doesn't, it's quadratic. And so the first thing I'm gonna, actually gonna do is we're gonna stuff this back inside the derivative. Uh, and we'll, we'll do this for incompressible flow, just for it simple. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing uh, compressible turbulence, you, you know, some of these tricks don't quite work. But we're first gonna do that. And then we'll say we're going to time average the whole thing. And so it's actually becomes the time average of that term. Now, each one of these terms, right? So generically, you can say that the velocity field is made up of an average plus a fluctuating, oops, get rid of the average, fluctuating quantity. So it's this fluctuating quantity. And so then when we're looking at the average, this is actually then, let's break that up. It's the average of uj average plus uj prime multiplied by ui average plus ui prime and that whole thing averaged okay so this this term ultimately then will come out as uj del j ui average and then what goes on the other side of the equation is the the Reynolds stress okay and so we'll end up uh, picking up this del j and then it'll be the fluctuating portions, U, J, U, I, fluctuating, averaged. Uh, and this is called the Reynolds stress. Um, but this one pops to the other side of the equation. And this uh, becomes effectively now impossible to solve with the averages. Okay, so I'll sort of write this full equation again now with all, all the work done. And so there's no time to change. You have the average velocity of J, convecting the ith velocity is equal to negative um, the derivative of the average pressure and then you get this this term and so we'll actually do this I'm going to stuff inside and say mu sij which we've done before uh, to kind of taking a look at this viscosity term and then you end up getting this um, oh I forgot a row there was a density term up front here density density and then you get sort of uh, density, and then u, j, u, i, fluctuating, fluctuating, averaged. Okay, so this is the term then becomes, if you model this accurately, you have this, this solved. You end up, you, you can't. And so one of the simplest versions that is out there is you just say, well, I don't know what this term is, and so, what you will do is you'll just say, you know what, I'm going to say that this term, uj prime ui average prime, I'm going to say it's proportional to sij because then I just have it. <laughs> it just adds up. 
So what people do then say that we'll say this is a turbulent viscosity times Sij. And then it just adds up. Now the challenge is this term <laughs> doesn't always even come close to this term. Uh, that there are actually many examples in cases where uh, the this term, what's happening in, in, the, in the sort of the fluctuating portions, if you actually you know do experimental measurements or you you do more complicated CFD where you're not doing this this Reynolds average, it's not even close to this. Like it's the opposite direction. Okay, one one example of this is actually in a wind tunnel. Uh, right there at the wind tunnel, one of the reasons you have sort of this wide bell mouth in a wind tunnel is uh, what's happening is you actually here have a, a change in the x velocity and the x gradient, right? So in the, the average, right? So the average velocity is actually increasing. And one of the reasons you're doing that is that it's actually killing, it's actually killing the turbulence, sort of stretching out the vorticities and, and, and doing that. Well, we'll see that later when we get into a little more of the graduate school kind of stuff and, and vorticity equation and things like that. We'll actually see that stretching term and show you how it's going to increase a local increase of vorticity and then engage diffusion to sort of smear it out. Uh, but this is exactly wrong. Like this would actually say that turbulence is increasing in that direction if you're just straight uh, proportional. Okay, so it's not true. So what ends up happening is then people then try to uh, come up with better models for this turbulent viscosity that can try to account for some of that stuff. And, and all of them ultimately fail. So one of the reasons I used to love teaching this is, is it, it's kind of like, I, I would take sort of two thirds of the lecture and, and really go into the nitty gritty here. That's more than I want to do on this book, but, but go read these chapters and you'll start seeing it. And so as you dig through, right, really start paying attention to what, what starts working, what's not working. And ultimately turbulence uh, is this thing full of all sorts of mixing and length scales. And so I'll sort of draw this last diagram. And I'm going to finish kind of the episode and just kind of show you some beautiful stuff. And one of the reasons I fell in love with this, and it's just it's complicated and it's, it's uh, but the ultimately the length scales, this is kind of the log of the size of the eddies. And this is the energy content of those eddies. It does something like this. Okay. And this is very particular. This is minus five thirds. We'll, we'll kind of go defend it later in a portion, later portion of this book club. Uh, why that's decaying at minus five thirds, but effectively here, somewhere in here, this is where all of the production is happening. This is this is the air flowing around that rock in the river. This is the air, you know, going over your airfoil or engaging with the boundary layer airfoil. Like it, it's sort of these production terms that are creating the turbulence, and then you know, larger eddies sort of dissipate the smaller eddies, and this sort of linear cascade. And that's what this minus five thirds is. Kind of all this energy transfer. To smaller and smaller time scales. So the eddies are getting smaller. I'll show you some cool videos. And then eventually dissipation kicks in and smears it out. And so as your Reynolds number increases, which we've talked about, what's actually going to happen is that the size of this extends. And so um, one of the highest Reynolds number flows is actually flow over a submarine. It's like 10 to the 9. And so that the size of scale of that is, is quite, quite gnarly. Uh, one of the last videos I'll show you here is actually um, a direct numerical simulation, large A simulation flow over aircraft flow. Like we're just getting to the point where we can really solve these numerically w without doing this trick, where you ultimately a direct numerical simulation would just say no, keep all of these length scales up to the up to this point of diffusion and solve it directly. So that's actually what I did my PhD on. I did that turbulent pipe flow. Large A simulation says solve it up to some point, say like here where I can, I can do the modeling myself of the minus kind of five thirds and into the dissipation. That's large eddy simulation. So both of those techniques are super powerful. I'm going to show you uh, now just some really fun, fun stuff. Oh, that didn't work. Okay, back. Got it, got it working now. Uh, so this was actually from a fluid experiment that I ran. You can look it up, Dougalby and Duran. Um, and this was what's happening here, the mixing experiment. We actually are flowing heavy water over light water from uh, sort of you know, from the, the, going this direction, okay? And so what happens with this heavier water, which we, we uh, highlight blue, is it'll start falling, okay? So there's really tailored turbulence. And you can see these length scales that start developing and mixing. Uh, and this is a cool experiment because what we actually did is we had, we had a little flapper here in the middle. And we would actually impose a, a wavelength. And so we are measuring what's the rate of increase of this mixing, right? So the mixing would grow like this. And this is, this is water, so it was actually a very slow experiment and we actually could take pictures and then we were sort of, you know, getting the full measurement using uh, optical measurements. So really, really fun experiment. Uh, so I want to start here just to, you can see 
sort of all of these different length scales that can develop. And even if you impose a certain length scale, right, that would be imposing a production length scale here, you, you eventually do still get all the rest of that sort of dissipation and things like that, right? So that's pretty fun. Uh, this is actually a numerical simulation of really, really tethered here once, so I'll hit play here. And so again, this is a heavy fluid uh, sort of falling into a bite fluid. Uh, this has application and fusion, applications and, and uh, in the supernova and things like that. So it's a, it's a very interesting mixing problem. And so you get a whole bunch of length scales of sort of these uh, bubbles and spikes, they call them. And then as they drive, there's shear that happens, which then creates more layers. And so, you know, this mixing layer grows with time. So that might be the sort of the global thing we're interested in, which is, which is you know, how fast do these two fluids mix? But the answer to that problem is all of this complexity that's sort of buried in here with, within the model and all these, all these, um, all these different sets of dynamics. Okay, so I, I find this absolutely beautiful. Again, and, and anytime I watch, I, I drink my coffee black, but anytime I watch someone sort of with creamer, I always sort of can visualize this mixing process. Okay, right? uh, so that was fun. Um, next one is, this is actually a, a shear so what you have here, this yellow jet is actually a sort of a jet going into, you can think of it going into air. So whether you think about it like behind a jet engine or just a free jet in space, uh, you see that the shear layer starts developing. This is called kiln Helmholtz vorticity. So you get these layers that develop. And this is a really cool uh, video because you're going to watch it sort of zoom in. Um, right now you have, you can see both layers here and, and on the right, it's kind of zoomed into a certain portion but you can see all these length scales develop right now you're starting to see it again. And so it'll zoom in right down to a smaller length scale where that shear is again, starting to happen. So, right. You get a little bit of this sort of self similarity, right? You're seeing the visualization now, again, this is all done the CFD. So you're showing the grid. And so you can start seeing all of this mixing um, and all the different length scales associated with turbulence, you know, and, and I think one of the, one of my favorite parts about uh, fluid mechanics and, and heat transfer is all kind of part of this uh, is it's still really, really hard. So it's scientifically engaging. Um, it, it can be mathematically challenging, but ultimately the applications are still real. Like we still want to drive cars, we still want to fly aircraft. And so all of these things uh, are, are super important to, to, you know, making useful products right here at Venus, we're, we're trying to make a high speed vehicle. Um, high-speed engines, high-speed vehicles, and this kind of stuff happens all over the place, right? So it's it's all part of making real things. And so I'll sort of finish here. This is a beautiful simulation now possible of flow over an airfoil, and this is actually transonic. And so this is a, one snapshot. Uh, there's other videos online, you can, you can see this, where it's, it's talking about, but you can see all of these. This is sort of the transition to turbulence, which we'll talk about later. And then it's sort of uh, all these kind of different transonic shock waves. And then look at all of this beautiful kind of fluid structure, uh, both on the, the suction side on the top, on the pressure side on the bottom. And so, you know, when, when we go into a wind tunnel, this is actually what we're, we're, we're seeing in the wind tunnel, right? And so uh, it's one of those, those pieces where if, if you watch the, the last uh, book club with Kuchiman, right, even in the 19, sort of late, late seventies, he was saying, Hey, I know computers are coming, but the power of analysis is still there and we're still going to use, need to use experiments. It's still true. Like it's 2024 right now. It's still true. Like there's always Reynolds numbers of which this is, this is too great to fully simulate. And there's all of these cases. So yes, CFT is absolutely helpful. It's great for visualization. There are some times where only CFT can actually let you have insight. Uh, so particularly with Venus inside the detonation engine, there's some really great simulations of detonation engines that actually let you see what's happening. Cause you know, in the engine, we sort of get the, it worked or it didn't work. And we have some, some experimental views of the detonation wave sort of from the outside, but all that fluid structure would be is uh, kind of opaque to us. Um, but so through simulations, we can get great insight. So, you know, I can never manage in a world where uh, you don't need experiments and I can never imagine a world where you don't need computations and in the process of creating real things, you, you got to use both. So anyways, this is one of those, it's one of my favorite topics. This is why uh, this completely captured my attention when I was getting my PhD. Uh, and that's why I, I got my PhD in this, but then as I always wanted to, you know, keep building real things, uh, as I kind of got late in my career, it, it's still important to, to, okay, this is scientifically interesting, but let's go, let's go fly. So we'll see you next time. And uh, again, if you like the book club, like in the videos, like and subscribe.